Well, hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of the Rice Cast. Pastor, I'm trying out for the worship team, working sounds, up to Sounds like it. I'm getting loosened up. <laughs> Got an audition later today. Uh we are here with another episode of the Rice Cast. My name's Anthony Russo. I am sitting here with Dr. Pastor Willie Rice. Pastor Willie, how are you today? Doing great. It's good to be back. Uh, I think we missed a week or so here, but uh, good to be back uh, with all the folks uh, via the podcast. That's right. The podcast people were, were actually quite kind this last week. Oh, okay. I did not. I didn't. They were starting to <laughs> grumble maybe, and now we're recording again. We'll stave off all the angry notes and letters I get. But um, it was actually a very exciting Sunday for you, even though you weren't preaching. Yeah. It was a pretty fun Sunday. You want to tell the listeners who might not know what happened this Sunday? Yeah, it was uh, exciting. Uh, It it really, we didn't coordinate all that. We just, uh, the schedule got very, very busy. And so uh, we had our campus pastors preaching anyway. Mm -hmm. So I just opted to let our senior associate, uh, uh, Brent Reeves, who always does a terrific job, preach. And Mm -hmm. again, everyone worked on the message. I was out quite a bit traveling last week, just had about a six, seven, eight day run where you're just speaking in a lot of different places. And I just realized I didn't have any margin. So I had, I decided, Hey, I'll, I'll sit this Sunday out and let the guys all preach. Well, it just so happened that over that same time period, our youngest grandson had made a profession of faith. Mm -hmm. He was extremely excited about it. He prayed at home with his mom and dad, very serious about it in trust in Christ and then wanted to be baptized. And he Mm. was very serious about wanting to be baptized uh, so much so that he was going to be baptized one way or the other. <laughs> and uh, so it, it, we wanted to do it right away. So it was uh, set for Sunday. And when I realized that, I just thought, well, this is providential. It's perfect. So I was able to go up to our East Lake campus where his family attends and be a part of the baptism um, ceremony up there in mm. the nine o'clock service. So it was really fun to be with our East Lake folks up there. It'd been a while since I'd been up there in person and to be with them and to celebrate Judd's baptism um, Sunday morning. Love Judd. Judd and my oldest are buddies. Are they? They yeah. they're yeah. friends. Uh, so I was pumped to hear that that happened this weekend. What you're you've had other grandkids? I think get baptized. Yeah, he's our third. Is it, what's what's it like as a grandparent to watch your grandkids? Yeah, it's grandkids. beautiful to watch your kids get baptized and make that decision, watch them making significant markers in their life, and, of course, nothing more important, really, than trusting God. And, you know, that can be uh, a journey uh, for young people mm-hmm. as they're making that step. Uh, certainly, um, there are other steps in a sanctification journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and when you have a child growing up in a Christian home, um, it, it sometimes is not as much as a one single dramatic moment as a kind of series of moments of opening and believing and confessing. And, and, and Christian families understand that. Yeah. I believe in terms of soteriology, there is a moment of justification. But in the way in which it works out in a young person's life, particularly when, again, it grows up in the church, it can be a series of steps sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's it, the the question is how significant is it? Very significant. And then to watch your 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 grandchildren make that step, and also to watch your children now adults guiding their children in that step. Well, yeah. it's a beautiful thing, and one that certainly causes Cheryl and I to rejoice, and we give great thanks for. We have six grandchildren. I hope to get to see them all yeah. come to Christ and uh, and be baptized. Yeah, I, I mean, I can speak for where I'm at in that process, and I can. It feels to me like the grandparents they're far more excited about anything the grandkids did, <laughs> do than anything I've ever done. We're, <laughs> it's just some some something happens. It's all amplified, and the grandkids just well, they're not as tired. They're not as uh, worried about other things. <laughs> That's I mean, true. we may be tired, but not of the kids. And you know, it's uh, uh, you just can enjoy moments. I think as parents, you obviously enjoy the moments, but it's like life is coming at you fast right. when your kids are home. It's right, coming right, right. so fast. And uh, as a grandparent, you're able to kind of get a little more perspective and watch things happen, not freak out about everything. Yeah. Um, and really enjoy the moments and know how precious they are. So uh, that's why grandparents go on and on about how wonderful it is to be a grandparent. It really is. It's, it's, as yeah. my friend says, it's the only thing that lives up to the hype. Yeah, yeah. And um, I should say one of the few things. Right, uh, sure. But, but, but uh, uh, it, it, uh, it really does. It's a wonderful thing. And to watch our grandchildren making good decisions and trusting in the Lord yeah. 
There's no greater joy. In all seriousness, there's no greater joy than to know your children are walking in truth. Absolutely. It's funny to hear you say it like that. That gives me something to look forward to, first of all, the grandparenting stage. But the picture you just painted makes me think of like a you know, football game, how the uh, offensive linemen celebrate a touchdown versus how the sideline celebrates a touchdown, yeah. right? The offensive linemen kind of look up and go like, did we score? Did something good happen? Because yeah, yeah. they're working and they're trying to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. The sideline's jacked when you score. Right. <laughs> they're jumping up and down. They saw the whole thing. That's, I never heard that uh, analogy, but it's probably true. The, the offensive linemen are picking themselves up and <laughs> wiping the blood away from... <laughs> yeah. Did something good I'm glad happen? Something good happened. But <laughs> I was just on my, my arm back. is broken. Yes, <laughs> the coach saw the whole thing. Was just going, yeah, it worked according to plan. Yes, that's right. That's funny. Uh, well, it's such a special moment. Yeah, I know. We had Riley come in. He was buzzing about it. it just was a special was, uh, yeah, moment yeah. for. And great to be with our East Lake family. Then I was able to slip over for the eleven o'clock or the ten forty-five service. I always get confused. Uh, the yeah, same. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> And uh, be with our Crystal Beach family, uh, just because yeah. in the general proximity in the North County. And um, so uh, didn't get to be with our Clearwater or Seminole group uh, Sunday, but was able to be with two of our four campuses. And, and just, it's always fun to be out there and seeing the people that I don't get to see every Sunday. Yeah. And you get to experience, you know, you get to get a cup of coffee mm-hmm. and you just have the guest experience at yeah, Calvary, yeah. which is fantastic. It I is. recommend it. <laughs> it's, it is great. Great messages, great worship, wonderful day. You point out something interesting, and we've touched on this a couple times, but I just like to keep everyone up to speed, that uh, on days like Sundays, like uh, this last Sunday, everybody's teaching live at the different campuses. They're teaching from the same text. Yep. Um, and it was so interesting because uh, a lot of us don't get to go to multiple campuses on one Sunday. But you were kind of reflecting some on how it's so interesting to hear the, the heartbeat kind of be the same, but then you have these different... Uh, spins on it depending on the personal uh, yeah yeah the the uh, people sometimes ask you know they like an inside view of how we're doing this and again uh, in our campuses about 50 percent of the time we i do stream out and am, am preaching by means of technology and about 50 mm-hmm. percent of the time right now our campus guys our campus pastors are preaching we chose campus pastors who wanted to preach who could preach and were gifted leaders and they're preaching more and more and and we're grateful for that but uh, we do meet uh, together, and we meet early in the week. We have a teaching team. You're a part of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to have a number of people speaking into the text. Uh, we all study, prepare, uh, and and then come into that meeting to dissect the text together. Uh, when I'm writing the message, preaching here, um, I am uh, giving our guys that message, usually by, toward the end of the week, about mm-hmm. Thursday is usually when I mostly have it written. Yeah. And uh, usually entirely written, and I send it to them. So they have that. They can see what I'm doing. But at the same time, we give them freedom to deal with the text, deal with the main points, uh, what's our main focus here. But it's fun that you see these different perspectives, these different personalities coming to play. And and, um, so you can hear, you know, different points or different illustrations or Mm -hmm. different stories and yet you hear a message that is addressing the same text and trying to teach the church the same spiritual truths mm-hmm. uh, that we're all uh, trying to communicate. Yeah, it's really been a special time for campuses. And I, I think it was now two Sundays ago inside of the X-150 uh, Impact Series that we covered that. We did a really great video where you were talking. Yep. and um, So I encourage you to go back and look at that if you didn't. But it really is like when you – I was just watching that video a couple of weeks ago and – and you're just kind of like, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's the whole series I've been like mm-hmm. this. But you're like, look at how unique all of these stories are, Pastor Tim, Pastor yeah. Riley, Pastor Dan, and with where they are now. Does it, I guess maybe my question for you out of that, being in the X-150 Impact, does it does it feel like we're in a good place with campuses oh, right I, now? It really does. Uh, and it's, you know, been challenging. We've had challenging moments. Campuses are. Uh, and, and I've talked to many, many pastors and churches, and they all do them a little bit different. Uh, there's some commonalities and Various ones will emphasize one thing or another. Uh, they're not easy. They can be challenging. Uh, and uh, uh, just as any growth brings mm-hmm. its own unique challenges. Uh, but I, I really think we've got, you know, great pastors at each of those campuses who uh, are really pastors at heart, teachers, Bible teachers, leaders, and um, and are doing a terrific job. And just to go and see how much they're, they're loved and being affirmed. 
uh, and how good a job they're doing. And I can't uh, stress strongly enough that when we do this collaborative kind of workshop that mm-hmm. we do usually on Tuesday, uh, talking about the text and, and so forth, um, I, I gain from them. This mm-hmm. isn't just about them sitting there and me you know, giving a 45 minute lecture, uh, we're, we're all very engaged and, and some of the best ideas may come from, you know, somebody else. Mm -hmm. And we are able to share that and then kind of work on the message, um, independently. To be clear for the listener, when he says he learns from them, he means the other people that are not me that are in the room. I just sit in there and you're very good. Also, I occasionally point out jokes every once in a while. No, you're very good. That's all I'm doing. Theological. (laughs) Two theological jokes. Yeah. I don't even know how I end up in that meeting, but yeah. I'm not asking any questions. I'm sticking in there now. I, I snuck in as a plus one at one point. Um, but yeah, it's it's been a – and this has just been a great X-150 impact series. This is my second campaign here. You've been um, through many campaigns like this. This is the third iteration of X-150, uh, which we've talked about a lot. How, how do you feel about how that's been so far? What's the What are you hearing from the people you're talking to? Now that we're just a couple weeks away from uh, commitment side, well, uh, great enthusiasm. It reminds me again that you know uh, we we, res- we, we you know, the Bible says where there's no vision, the people perish. Some translations translate that the people literally scatter. It, the opposite means vision as a way of uniting people and and drawing people together and say, hey, here's who we are, and we're running after that. And these are seasons in our church. That happen every couple of years where we talk about the vision. Hmm. Uh, What is it the Lord would have us to run after in the next immediate season? So I sense a great deal of excitement, a great sense of unity. Uh, People are very uh, engaged around different parts of the X-150 vision. And uh, I don't know what the results will be. I know whatever it will be will be uh, what God wants us to have in that moment, he will provide. Uh, sometimes it's not all at once. Sometimes some of it comes uh, in the in the midst of the, the years. Mm. But whatever it is, we're going to we, – I just think it will be very good. I do have some information I will share this coming weekend oh. about uh, the advance, where we are uh, with in terms of advanced commitments and our leaders and, and so forth. And that is a great report. I look forward to giving that. So a little teaser there. Mm. Um, and um, – and obviously, by the end of March, we're asking everybody who's a part of the Calvary family, uh, members or people who are just faithfully involved and supporting us uh, to uh, weigh in and to help us uh, win a great victory in this X-150 impact campaign. Mm-hmm. It has been so exciting. And we just uh, looking ahead yesterday at the next couple of weeks, there's just all kinds of exciting. It's been just end to end. Every week I look back, I'm like, there's highlight moments, there's there's stuff that's just humbling to see the work God is doing. Uh, it's been a very fun series. I wanted to I wanted to talk to you though about uh, you did preach two weeks ago on um, the impact of extravagant generosity. Um, it was a, it was a great message. It was about uh, well maybe just quickly to summarize for some because it was two weeks ago. I know everybody's got a lot going on. We're getting ready for spring break and things. Mm. Could you just briefly? Uh, it was the story with the alabaster jar. Correct. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Out of Mark 14, uh, it was the text uh, where uh, it's right before uh, Passion Week, and um, hmm. Jesus is at the home. If 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 the story of Mark 14 is the same story as in John 12, right? I think it is. I think that's a different story than Luke 7. We went into that in the message. They're similar but different. Mm-hmm. But uh, if if Mark 14 and John 12 are talking about the same story, then it was at the home of Lazarus. Martha and Mary, and uh, and also, according to Mark, a guy named Simon the leper. Hmm. So somehow, you know, if you put those stories together, you get all of that. It's possible those are two different stories within a matter of sure. two or three days, but that seems more unlikely. Mm-hmm. So it would have happened days before Passion Week and uh, in Bethany, just outside of Jerusalem. And then there's this spontaneous act of extravagant generosity where, again, if you pull in John's story with Mark's, it would have been Mary that took an alabaster jar of very rare perfume mm-hmm. ointment and just poured it out, mm. poured it out on Jesus. It was extravagant, and it was criticized by some of the disciples there who thought it was wasteful. Yeah, This would have been a kind of jar that's an heirloom that you keep all your life, that you may take a drop out, as you know, with perfumes. Right, a right. A little dab will do you, yeah. as, as an old commercial <laughs> used to say. Yeah, a little bit will do you, and, uh, you know, it's very rare yeah. and very expensive. She just poured the whole jar out. Yeah. So 
there were a lot of disciples who thought that's extravagant, that's crazy. You shouldn't you shouldn't have done that. We could have sold this. If you're ready to get rid of it, we could have sold it, taken it, and done something with the money. Um, but that extravagant generosity is an act that Jesus said will be told around the world wherever the gospel is preached, and yeah. it has been. And uh, and so it just we were we've been talking about. I mean, the unifying theme in this series is kingdom impact, right? Acts that people make that have this huge, outsized, oversized kingdom impact. Yeah. Far greater than they thought. And uh, and that act, Jesus said, you know, is going to be known around the world. Mm. So that simple act of extravagant generosity had a major impact in the kingdom. Yeah. And you, had a, you talked about the criticism. It was interesting. There was a quote you had in there. It says, many people attempt to mask their stinginess by criticizing others' generosity. I thought that was so interesting. Had a couple conversations with people after the sermon about that. I guess, um, how, do, how do you see that play out today, mm, yeah. uh, the, the criticism of, of people being generous? Well, it, it's, um, it, it does happen. It's interesting. It, it's like, to some degree, sometimes if a person is very much uh, um, on fire for the Lord, zealous about their faith, mm-hmm. uh, it, it makes people who are not uncomfortable. And not so much the lost person, although sometimes an unbeliever can think, well, that's really weird. Mm-hmm. But especially a carnal Christian, mm. it makes them very uncomfortable. A, a person who, on the one hand, says they're a follower of Christ, but then they, they are not serious about their faith at all. And right. you're seeing this person who, in one sense, is describing the same thing you say you have, but it's very clear they have something different than you. Mm. And, and that is a very convicting thing. So one of the, I think, defense mechanisms is to criticize it. Mm-hmm. Well, they're a little bit overzealous. They're mm-hmm. a little bit crazy. Uh, you know, whatever. You kind of almost look down on your nose at it. And I think that can be true with generosity. I think sometimes that um, we all battle stinginess. We all battle the ref- the reflex of not being willing to give and let go. And so sometimes one of the ways in which we mask that is to criticize someone who is. Mm. We go, I think they could have done this, or they could have done this with their stewardship. Sure. And it's, you know, a lot of times churches get criticized for this. You you build something uh, that you desire to see it glorify the Lord, or, uh, you know, uh, and somebody will say, well, they could have done X with it. Mm. And you always want to go, well, are you doing that? Mm. Like, like uh, well, they could have built a hospital with all that money. You want to go, well, how many hospitals have you built? Uh, because most of the hospitals I know around the world have been built in the name of Christianity mm-hmm. and in the name of Jesus. Certainly thousands mm-hmm. have. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the whole modern hospital phenomenon was something that came out of a kind of a Christian charitable movement. So you, 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 um, you know, it, it, it's like it doesn't make sense. Mm. Well, they could have, and so in the story of Mark 14, uh, and we know from this, from John's account, again, if we harmonize those are two accounts, then in John's account, this was Judas leading the charge. Mark says there were multiple disciples that were upset, but Judas was a thief. Hmm. Uh, he was taking money out of the treasury. Right. But he masked that by saying, by criticizing the woman who was giving this generous and extravagant gift. Mm. So just be careful when you hear somebody. Look, we're all for good stewardship. Mm-hmm. There's a moment when we need to practice, you know, uh, again, wise discernments and the way that we give. We don't want to be wasteful. Mm-hmm. But I want to tell you, if you give to the Lord and you invest in the kingdom of God, there are going to be people who think that's wasteful. Yeah. Uh, they really are. They are going to think you're crazy for giving that much money to the church, that yeah. much money to Christian missions. Why are you doing that for uh, because it looks like a complete waste. And if, if if people who are not motivated by the kingdom of God don't think you're being a little crazy, you, you're probably not doing near enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting, and it, it feels, at least to me, uh, it feels like that's more prevalent today, the, the criticism. It, it, like everybody's got a, well, you did this, but you could have done this. Yep, or yep, yep, or yep. you did that, why didn't you do this? Yep, yep. I think we've talked here about the old joke of um, – like on Twitter, if you say like, boy, I like oranges, and somebody comes in and says like, do you notice he didn't say anything about apples? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you imagine how a grape feels reading this? Like it yeah, just yeah. – and and I think to, to your point, it's so true. Like I don't think it's made everybody more generous, that whole thing. I think it's no, made people it less generous. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, I mean, right. It, 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 when you see that kind of negativism, mm-hmm. uh, and I've seen it. 
uh, in churches. Uh, it's it's usually not because they're trying to really be generous. Mm-hmm. Like Judas said, we could have sold this and given it to the poor. But we now know he wasn't concerned about the poor. He was concerned about taking, skimming off the top. Mm. Uh, and people steal from God all the time uh, when we do not honor God with our time, talent, and treasures. The Bible actually says it's stealing from God. Mm. So in essence, we mask our thievery, stealing from God, with this kind of look down the nose and criticize how they're spending the money mm. and um and and it's really not a, a desire for good stewardship it's just masking our stinginess yeah that person's generous and it makes us feel bad because we're not and we don't want to be like that so mm. uh, i there there is in the christian movement this glorious extravagant over-the-top generosity sometimes that isn't going to make sense to people who don't love jesus yeah I wonder if you would go as far as to say, if you find yourself off put by someone's generosity, is that cause for you well, to go like? Go back and question. Yeah, go back and question. And and I could give examples, but I don't want to give examples. Yeah, but, you know, I thinking of a time now when we had a, a family give a very generous gift to uh, a part of the ministry here, and it really it, it is history has shown it was a catalytic and important gift. Mm in um, that ministry. Uh, it literally was a game changer. Mm. But I remember there was a family criticizing it. Why is this church doing that? Yeah. It seemed like we were doing building something that they felt like was extraneous, I guess. And uh, and yet at the same time, they were posting pictures from a theme park uh, mm. on Facebook and so forth. And, and, and I don't, you know, I got to go to a theme park if you want to. Sure. Spring break, go knock yourself out. Yeah. I, I mean, I got no problem with that. But I remember just seeing the disconnect of that and thinking, that's odd. You would criticize, first of all, someone giving an extravagant gift because you don't like the way it's being spent. But at the same time, you're, you know, you're not giving anything. It's mm. a, why do you worry about it? It mm. wasn't even your money. Right. And, and yet, at the same time, here you are doing something that is also very extravagant, but, but selfish. And I'm... Listen, I don't mean selfish in a bad way. There, it's okay to take a vacation, of take course. a cruise, yeah, yeah. go to Disney World, buy the pastor a souvenir. Uh, it's all fine, <laughs> but but don't don't you know? But but how can you be high and mighty about uh, they're wasting a lot of money? Sure, when you're dropping twenty five bucks for a hot dog in Disney World, it's right. like come on, yeah. Um, go go have a good time at Disney World. I'm all for it. Yeah, but rejoice when people feel motivated to give to the Lord's work, and if you are criticizing that. You probably need a heart check real fast. Mm. You probably need a heart check. Wait a second. Mary was giving out of her love for Jesus. Mm. And Judas was upset because he wanted more money. Mm. So there you go. Yeah. I I couldn't help but think, too, when you were going through this text about another another example of giving uh, in Acts. So you had this, like, extravagance or extravagant giving. Generosity, excuse me, talking about generosity. So you have Mary's giving in this story, and then you have the story in Acts of An- uh, Ananias and Sapphira's mm. giving, yeah, which is giving to the to the church. That was what they were yep. doing. Yep. Um, but if you're familiar with the story, they uh, they give they with they say they gave everything from a sale, but they withheld some, uh, and then they're struck down dead immediately, separately, yep. uh, but immediately. I'm wondering when you look at the uh, the dichotomy or the juxtaposition of those two sir they're both both are examples of somebody giving they're they're being generous i would think and you can correct me if i'm wrong on that so there's a degree of generosity at least um but yet the the one it, you know jesus looks at and says wherever the gospel is told this story will be told and the other they're struck down dead immediately mm, yeah. <laughs> so what do you see what jumps out as the uh differences in those well, executions the story that you're referring to in the book of acts is uh uh, you know, it's an unusual story. It's a powerful story. Certainly, if every hypocrite were struck down in church, uh, there would be <laughs> we would be doing more funerals, uh, and uh, we, we might ourselves have met early yep. demise. Yep. So, you know, uh, th- this was certainly something that was an extraordinary moment. Uh, but it struck fear. The Bible says on the entire church, and I'm sure it did. Um, I was a lot more honest of a kid <laughs> when I heard this story yes. growing up. Just to be Get safe. Be down. Um, and as I said, so I, when Bible scholars teach that passage, it, it appears 
the sin was not, you know, they, they, they said that they were giving all, they had sold a piece of property, they got the proceeds of the property, and were giving it all to the church. Mm-hmm. In reality, they did not give all of it. Right. They held some back. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what portion they held back. So, the sin, it seems to be, is the deception there. Mm. It is not uh, that what they did would not have otherwise been generous. Mm-hmm. It may well have been very generous. Mm-hmm. It is not that they were acquired necessarily by some law to sure. give everything that right. they made from the sale of the land. It seems to be, though, they were using in that moment the opportunity of giving to call attention to themselves and to glory themselves, mm. and to glory in themselves. Uh, and they were just dishonest. And uh, so a combination of their dishonesty, their, their desire to self-exalt, um, is what God judged severely in that moment. Mm. So that is what we should say as we do give. Mary is a positive example. She gave publicly, mm-hmm. uh, and it was a spontaneous, beautiful act of generosity. Ananias and Sapphira gave deceitfully. Mm. They claimed more than they had actually done. So I think the lesson there would be, as we give, um, let's be honest. Let's not take the glory from God. Let's mm. do it not for the praise of men, but out of our love for God. Hannah and I, Sapphira, wanted others to be impressed with them. Uh, Mary was just giving out of generosity to the Lord. Mm. So I think that's the lesson there. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you sell property, um, you know, uh, it, it's not saying you have to give it everything to God, mm-hmm. um, uh, but don't, just don't lie. Yeah. And don't seek the glory of that moment. And if you want to give everything to the Lord, then do it. Good. Yeah. Give everything sure. to the Lord. Right. Uh, but, it, but let's check our motives and our hearts. So just like Judas was completely deceitful, not mm-hmm. wanting to give it all. Uh, Ananias and Sabara so show us that it is possible to give, but to do so in a way that is offensive to God mm. because it draws attention to ourselves and it's more about glorifying us than it is glorifying God. Mm. It's so, in- yeah, it's so interesting and there's so much, I mean, there's so much taught on money and generosity and yep. giving as you could just go on and on about that. But I, I'm wondering as we are kind of turning a corner here for X-150, we're into March. At the end of March, we're doing our uh, our Commitment Sunday on March 26th, so we're asking everybody to come forward. What would you ask that our Calvary family, that people that want to support X-150 are thinking about and praying about as they consider taking a step uh, in generosity, preparing for March 26th? Well, it's, it is a big moment. We do this every so often, every mm-hmm. few years. Um and this is that season to ask our church family, hey, let's let's make an investment in the kingdom of God that's going to determine what we're going to be able to do and where we're going to be able to go in the next few years. And we have some great, great, exciting things that we're trying to run after. First, I think everybody can do something. Hmm. You know, everybody can do something. Uh, I, I don't know that we have any, I guess we could measure it. I don't know that we do measure this, but wouldn't it be wonderful if, if you would know that every single member of Calvary did something. Yeah. Everybody stepped up and did what they could. Wasn't an equal amount, but everybody Mm -hmm. pitched in. Everyone did something. So first of all, we can all do something. Number two, I would say pray. Don't just do what's easy or reflexive or let's just tip God and be done with it. Uh, What does God want to do in my life in this moment? Mm. And ask God and seek him. And, uh, uh, some of the most beautiful stories in moments like this are where families and people have stretched mm-hmm. and they feel like God is leading them to do something that may be bigger than they are and requires faith, uh, requires even some sacrifice. And they do it and God comes through. I've heard so many stories like that. Mm-hmm. So many. Every time we do this, I, I people will come up and say, we made a commitment several years ago. We weren't sure we could do all of it, to be honest, but we trusted God. We laid it before him, and God has been so good. This Mm -hmm. has happened. That has happened. Uh, And as we say, this is not a guilt. This is a guilt-free thing. Sometimes people have uh, plans that change. We we understand that. That's why this is not a—we don't call it a pledge. We don't call it—it's certainly not a debt. It's just a faith commitment. This is what I hope to do. I would just encourage everyone to pray, to take it seriously, 
and and to lay it before the Lord and then do whatever the Lord says do. Mm. If everyone will do what the Lord tells them to do, uh, there will be an abundance to do everything that God wants us to do. I'm absolutely convinced of that. So if everybody did something Mm. and everyone took it seriously, laid it before the Lord and said, God, what would you have us to do? Uh, I am absolutely convinced that uh, we'll see great things happen, not just in the financial resources that will be provided, but in the life of our church and in the lives of our church families. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's such a good word, and uh, we are all excited as we turn here. And that's such a good point you said there at the end. I mean, the, the giving is important. It's necessary. Um, it's, it's impactful. Um, but then we also do, we love when we see people really catch the vision for yep. this and ask questions about serving overseas internationally, ask questions about we've so many about Calvary yep. college, wanting to get involved with the compassion center. Uh, that's just as important. Uh, we're going to need those people too. And you can do both of those things. I'll put this in the show notes at calvary.us slash X150. You can express, Hey, I want to be involved in this. I want to be in the loop on how I can help in this area. And you can also make your faith commitment, yeah. uh, on that page. So calvary.us slash X150 for both of those things. Uh, but it's going to be an exciting, uh, last couple of weeks here, pastor. We're, we're ready yep, to go. We're, we're, Again, the ask is is clear. We're asking everybody to uh, uh, pray, and then uh, on March the 26th, if they haven't already, on March Mm -hmm. the 26th, there'll be an opportunity for everybody. Even if you've done something in advance, there'll be a special moment to just lay this before the Lord in our service. Uh, But we're asking people to be ready to make that commitment on or before March 26th. The first fruit is, uh, we've talked about that a little I'll talk about it a lot more in the next two weeks. First fruits is just what's the first part of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, we often say, um, hey, give as much as you can up front. Now, that's everybody's different there. And some mm-hmm. people are planning on what they'll give over three years. And honestly, it'll be the end of the year, next year before that gift is made. But give as much as you can up front. It allows us to get started with a tremendous beginning. And uh, we're just saying that really from March 26th to Easter Sunday, which is two weeks, um, the very time in which Mary made her gift mm. of an alabaster uh, ointment. Yeah. Um, just do as, do, do the, as much of it as you can mm-hmm. up front, and it allows us to get started with, with a, a great, um, as I said, a great beginning. So the next several weeks, very important, historic, really, in, in terms of Calvary's life, and we'll set the table, really, for what God is going to do the next several years here at Calvary. It's a great time to be a Calvary. We say it every week because it's true every week. <laughs> it's always a great time to be a Calvary. Uh, but, um, yeah, we hope you can join us here. Uh, just Again, I'm just running through in my head the next couple of Sundays, and there's just exciting things going on in all of them, yeah. updates to share. Yeah. We have some you know, live interviews. We've done interviews almost every week with different mm-hmm. aspects of the ministry. The next two weeks are just going to be really exciting. And actually, we have a live interview component at every campus this week. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's kind of a neat, rather than just do it by video from Clearwater, there's actually going to be, you know, every campus is going to get to meet uh, one of our church planners, somebody that we have been supporting, and um, and uh, it w- will be at each campus. I, I think it's going to be fantastic, and um, it's, it'll be a weekend you won't want to miss. Mm-hmm. Join us. 9 and 1045 uh, at each of our campuses and online. Uh, you can join us there. We'd love to see you. Uh, and again, I'll put some of that information in the show notes. I'll put the link to the sermon if you missed it. I'll put the uh, X150 link down there. Uh, and uh, we appreciate you, listeners. Thank you for coming along on the podcast. Thank you for uh, telling your friends about it. It means the world. And we'll be back with another episode here very soon. Mm-hmm.